Hello, my name is David Ades, and I'm a poet living in Sydney, Australia. And each month I hold host a poetry reading series and now podcast called Poets Corner in association with West Words, which is a literary organisation that is operating out of Parramatta in Sydney's West. West Words is Western Sydney's literature development organisation. Poets Corner is part of West Words public programming that celebrates the richness, diversity and insight literature offers. Especially in these times, we thank the ongoing support of Create New South Wales, the Cultural Fund of Copyright Australia, City of Parramatta Council, Blacktown City Council and Campbelltown City Council, as well as the many project partners that have enabled us to continue to provide opportunities to writers and audiences. We hope that this new world will see us sharing and a closeness of spirit. So each month I invite a poet to read poems and talk about uh, their work around a theme of the poet's choice. Our guest poet today, whom I will introduce in a moment, is Judy Johnson, who will read poems and talk on the theme of inheritance. But before I introduce Judy, I would just like to do an acknowledgement of country. I'm recording this from my home in Beecroft, Sydney. Judy is recording from her home in Cardiff, which is part of the Lake Macquarie area. I would like to pay my respects to and acknowledge the elders, past, present and emerging of the Wallamida people, the traditional, traditional custodians of the land in Beecroft, and also of the Awabakal people, the traditional custodians of the land in Lake Macquarie. And to acknowledge also that their land has never been given up or ceded. And before I introduce Judy, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of biographical information about her. Judy Johnson has published five full-length books and several chapbooks. Her collections have been awarded the Victorian Premier's Prize for Poetry and have been shortlisted in the Western Australian and New South Wales Premier's Awards. She has won the Melbourne University Wesley Michelle Wright Prize three times and individual poems have received the Josephine, Josephine Ulrich, Bruce Dorr, Val Vallis, John Shaw Nielsen, Roland Robinson and many other awards. And uh, Judy, I would also like to congratulate you on your recent listing for the Newcastle Poetry Prize, again. Uh, her verse novel, Jack, mentored by the late Dorothy Porter, was on both the Sydney and Melbourne University syllabus. For 11 years, she was managing editor for the Wagtail series of poetry chapbooks from Picaro Press, a small press publishing venture established by her partner and poet, Rob Reel. She is the co-editor, along with Judith Beveridge, David Musgrave and Martin Langford of a 25 year retrospective of Australian verse, contemporary Australian poetry. Welcome to Poets Corner, Judy. Thank you, David. It's good to have you on. Now, you well, told me when you, you. when you chose your theme of inheritance that you meant it in both a personal and a historical uh, uh, way. Um, and then you, when you sent me copies of the phones, you provided me with a copy of the author's note to dark convicts, which um, tells a story, as it were, of um, the kind of inheritance that you're referring to, uh, which is in large part the inheritance of ancestry. And I would love for you to share that story before we start any of the poems with our audience. Um, certainly, uh, that's Dark Convicts was my latest book. Um, and it involved a lot of research, but basically it centres around the life and times of my two African-American convict ancestors who came over on the first fleet. And um, not many people know that there were 11 um, black convicts on the first fleet, and they were actually... Most of them had been emancipated by the British in the American War of Independence in the 1770s. And um, the Loyalists promised the um, slaves that were on the plantations and working, you know, in maritime industries, that if they joined the Loyalist Army, that they would then emancipate them. And even though the Loyalists lost the war, 
they negotiated with the um, Patriot slave owners and they actually, many of those um, black men and women ended up in London. And the reason why um, there were 11 on the first fleet is that there were no jobs in London and there was very little, um, there was very little set in place um, as far as the poverty stricken white um, population was concerned and nothing at all for the black population. So they turned to petty crime and that's how certainly my ancestors ended up on the first fleet. John Martin um, stole a bundle of clothing and John Randall, who the reason why there are two relatives in my ancestry is that John Martin married the daughter of his best friend, John Randall, who was also one of the dark convicts. And he, um, he stole a steel watch chain in Manchester. Interestingly, he was uh, um, quite a notable member of the army. And when he got to New South Wales, he was given all sorts of, um, all sorts of privileges that John Martin was never given. And that was because of his time in the Loyalist Army. And it's interesting to look at the two men and see that even though they were both um, on the same level playing field as far as where they had come from initially, John Randall was elevated in terms of what he had done with his life and also because um, he picked up skills in the army that would serve him in the new colony, like learning how to shoot a, a brown vest musket which was um, a very valuable skill. He became one of only three of the governor's shooters, game shooters. Well, I'd, I had never heard about uh, the Negro convicts that came out to Australia. So this is a, a, an absolute revelation to me. I'm sure it would be for many of our audience. Um, how long have you known about this story? Or, or is it a story that's been sort of pieced together during your lifetime? Or was it handed down to you from before? Um, it was pieced together. And the reason why I included um, in the list that I gave you of poetry um, a photograph of my great-grandparents was that that was really where um, the investigation started for me and also for my sister, who is my late sister now. We started to investigate because we found a photograph of our great-grandparents and my great-grandfather was this tall Irishman with anecdotally with bright orange hair because obviously it was a black and white photo. Mm. And um, my great-grandmother was very, very dark, very short, very dark. And the story in our family ran that she was a South Sea Island princess. Mm. Um, that was the way to make it palatable to have a dark, <laughs> a dark person in one's ancestry at that time. And um, my sister actually started the investigation and came up with these, um, this first fleeter, dark convict, who was not of South Sea Island um, royalty, no. but was, ha actually had been a slave. Okay, well, that, that uh, poem, Photograph of My Great-Grandparents, is, is a wonderful place to start, so... Oh, I'd love to read it. Photograph of My Great-Grandparents. My white great-grandfather is frightened of the camera's flash. You can tell by the way he is standing. Seconds before the photograph was taken, he would have faced the dark sheeted box as if it were a one-man firing squad. My black great-grandmother stands next to him in a worn skirt and shoes, carrying a Gladstone bag. She looks like some homespun doctor, the symbol of the Hippocratic Oath woven in the two snakes of her done-up cardigans, buttons and holes. However they seem, neither of them are in the image but beyond it. 
She is stirring bush remedies in an old saucepan. He is in the paddocks cleaning rabbit traps of bloody fluff and paws, and I am left with this artificial moment, my great-grandmother smiling as if she knows that light is the liar that keeps on reflecting, remembering the first day they met, those two straggly gums in the foreground of her vision, and collecting firewood, the man she would marry, despite the scandal of their families. He was pale, like the ghost of some relative come back to visit. It stopped her behind the plough she had been pushing all morning, turning the blind eyes of seed potatoes to the sun. She was not frightened by the flash of him through the trees just afterwards, that reduction to everyday light and her heart sent back to its crooked digging. I should say that how they met was that my great grandmother was a servant um, on the property and in the house of my great grandfather. So she was actually was pushing plows and, and doing all sorts of, you know, um, slave like work for the family. And that's how and I, I, I discern from the scandal of the families that presumably wasn't handed down to you. You hadn't heard that before, but I, I discern a great love story here. A great love story because he was basically disinherited oh. by marrying her. So, yes, it was a very romantic love story. But I still to this day don't know whether she herself perpetuated the South Sea Island princess myth or if, you know, if it was um, surrounded her and she didn't bother correcting it because really John Martin, the first fleeter, was her grandfather. She could not know her true heritage. Um, and so that remains a mystery. Mm. Uh, I'm sure there's always some mystery, but it's nice to have found out what you found out, isn't it? To... Oh, yes, yes. I was delighted, actually. Mm. People say to me, weren't you shocked or horrified or blah, blah, blah? And I said, no, actually, I think the writer in me was absolutely thrilled. I thought it was <laughs> terrific. Yeah, well, these poems that you've given us, um, there are uh, introductions uh, here to your grandparents, but also to other uh, members of your family. The next, the next poem, Bean Picking, introduces your mum. Yes, it does. Um, this poem's actually part of a series, the only series that I've written about my mother. I've written extensively about my father, who died when I was seven. But um, uh, from after that time, I had a difficult relationship with my mother for several reasons, but um, this, I think, this section actually suggests some of the um, some of the difficulties that can arise between mothers and daughters, and also um, how much of my particular personality as a child, and I think many child's personalities are formed by really early experiences. I think that my life became very different and I became a very different person after my father died because I had to. I had to become a caretaker for my mother. And I think um, that event really changed me. And I think that this poem suggests that even though I was only probably nine, um, the uh, incidents that I'm talking about here, it was still a turning point for me where um, I was no longer a child, but had to become an adult. Bean picking. The man threw us chaff bags from the back of the truck. A mist of wheat dust swirled and stuck, then mouldered in the breath. 50 cents for each one filled, he said, and as if his words were a starter's gun gone off, women with triangular scarves on their heads and meandering varicose vein conversation, bent over and hand after hand raced to the end of the row. I dawdled, dragging the bag behind me, distracted by almost everything, butterflies, ladybugs, the way the sun splashed liquid saffron between the rows. 
Each beam was covered in palish fur, like the skin on my arms, and subtly curved a blade, hiding its true intentions. There's a trick to it, my mother said, and gave one quick snap between the fingers above the flower. Unzipped with a fingernail, the shriveled bean babies huddled in a row along the pod. Unwilling to abandon them to the darkness of the bag, I ate till my jaw ached green. And my mother, hungry all her life, made no attempt to stop me. That night, my greed exacted its fermenting retribution in the gut, and I learned the lesson what must be paid for, that quality of saffron light, impetuous happiness with its snap of the wrist, chlor chlorophyll crunch, and what I only knew then as a dry catch in the back of my throat that kept me empty long after I should have stopped eating, the chaff bag of solitude dragging behind me. Yeah, um, it's very moving. I, I, I have a sense that every generation has to watch the next generation as it sort of stumbles along and makes whatever mistakes it's going to make. And to some extent, we have to let that happen. Um, so your mother, knowing what she knew, kind of didn't stop what was going to happen from happening. So that I guess in a way you learn something from that. It's a hard lesson to learn, I guess. But um, do you think that is inheritance too, that the a generation that allows? It definitely is. And I mean, really, my mother only, my mother's problems were probably there when my father was alive, but she was so dependent on him that it was the end of her world when he died as well. I mean, maybe it's, perhaps it's a generational thing, but she literally did not know how, how to um, sign a cheque, how to pay a bill, how to function in any way. My father, although I loved him dearly, was a very um, controlling person and she never really had to live um, as an independent person in any way, shape or form. And she didn't know how to do it. And so um, that was the source of the problem, I think. So both of our lives changed. Certainly I loved her dearly, but um, she, I think she perhaps more than my father has made me the person that I am, for better or worse. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think Australia was a very patriarchal world in that generation. Oh, um, absolutely. But my father was even more patriarchal than most. <laughs> um, nobody liked him much, I must say. Um, he was very antisocial, uh, misanthropic, one might even say. Um, yes, so people had good things to say at his funeral, I hear, but I think they were being polite. Well, uh, he comes from a different lineage altogether, doesn't he? Well, he does. But the thing was, I was aware of him as a father and my sisters were aware of him as a father and he was just the best father. But he was very insular. It was His family was everything and everybody outside the family you know, didn't get a look in as far as his concerns were, were, um, were laid out. But he was a wonderful father. But um, when I tell people this little anecdote, they laugh, but it, it kind of sums up his personality. My father was the only person I ever knew who wrote corrections in the margin of the Bible <laughs> and uh, challenged the things that were written and um, made little uh, sarcastic asides. And, well, do you still have that Bible? I do, I do. <laughs> it's a classic. <laughs> uh, and you, you're going to introduce him in the next poem. Uh, yes, I am. My mother, my maternal line was the African-American line, but my father was, his name was Ian William Angus, and he was um, very Scottish, and his parents 
were apparently, I, they died before I was born, I was a late life baby, but apparently their um, Scots accent was so broad that nobody could understand them. This is called Heather Rope. My father, Ian William Angus, Clan Donald, from the Isle of Sleet, descendant of the Thane of Argyll, 1135, and Ephrica, daughter of Olaf the Swarthy, once told me how it was made. It took two people with patience, one to feed the heather to the other, who would then walk backwards, twisting the strands clockwise on a stick. The rope was used for tying up boats and gathering kelp, sometimes to fashion shutters. My father knew nothing of DNA, the twists and turns of inheritance, just how heather was stronger than straw and stronger still if taken from the same hill. Not long before he died, my father developed a single knot in the white of each eye, the gnarled burls of Pinguecula. All those years dwelling on clan alliances and betrayals, Richard II and James I, the treasonable treaty of Lord of the Isles with the King of England in 1462, convinced his mind's eye that his body was a boat built to carry the stories. His windows on the only world he knew began to weave old cares from another hemisphere into a heather rope, eventually twisting his eyelids closed, then tugging his hole full of ghosts home to history. Yeah, so this poem is all about strands and knots and weaves and twists and turns of inheritance, so it's completely apt to your theme. Uh, <laughs> yes. How much does this understanding of your mingled inheritance um, bring clarity to how you see yourself? Um, clarity or well, confusion, perhaps, I don't know. Clarity is a strong word. <laughs> <laughs> um, so much of personality is not informed so much by inheritance, but is set up in direct opposition to or um, deliberately avoids or... Um, I think it's very, very interesting. I've always been interested in the history, Australian history, full stop. And my own personal history is just an offshoot of that. I do find that it, the past does complete us, right or wrong, good or bad. I think we need to know, um, which doesn't mean that we have absorbed all of those things. It means that those things are either latent or they're obvious inside us or a combination of the two or neither. But I think it's important that we know where we come from. These poems, um, they're so personal. Are they hard to write? Um, in the early days of my writing, my early writing is if something was deeply personal, I would write it in the third person, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is the opposite of um, how you think of confessional poetry. Yeah. But I notice as time goes on, perhaps I'm less afraid, perhaps I don't care quite so much how much that people see of me in my poetry, but I've noticed... Um, particularly recently, that I'm not afraid to use um, the eye autobiographically. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, these poems, um, they, they are historical in a sense, even in their personal history. So there is some distance from the events they describe. Yes, that's true. Although perhaps not so much with, with the next one, which is, which is about your sister. Yes, well, once again, I think that word distance, I think the time, it takes me a long time to write personal poems about something that's happened. Yes. And I think it's that, um, I think it's that time that allows everything to mellow. I, some people automatically react to the things going on around them by writing a poem. It's never worked that way with me. I need to mull things over. I need to work things out. But this is an autobiographical poem. Um, my sister June, who was also the sister who um, looked into our family ancestry. 
uh, died of breast cancer and she was, she was aware that she was dying and she was giving away her precious things to her sisters and she wanted me to take an opal ring, which mum had always told me, mum had owned the ring and mum had given it to June. Don't ask me why, <laughs> because it was an unlucky ring. But um, my sister June was, uh, wouldn't tolerate any nonsense. And she said, it's ridiculous. And I said, I'm not going to wear it. She said, I don't care, you just take it. So I did, but I've never worn it because um, even though I'm not superstitious, uh, the legend went in our family that every time someone wore the opal ring, somebody would die. And my sister, I mean, this is very black humour indeed, and I would never have pointed it out to her. But she was, when she told me she wanted me to take the ring and it was ridiculous to be superstitious, she was sitting up in bed with oxy, oxygen um, tubes in her nose saying, it's not unlucky, don't be ridiculous. So this is called Opal. And it's got a little uh, epigraph from a fellow called Isidore Kosminski who wrote The Magic and Science of Jewels and Stones. And he said this, Perhaps against no other gem has the bigotry of superstitious ignorance so prevailed as against the wonderful opal. The names could be those of pedigree stallions, Tabashir, Menelite, Harlequin, Contraloos, with reds like rubble on fire or a pair of pink silk ballet shoes dragged across a stone floor by their ribbons. The blue greens are half air, half ocean, the eyes of knowing tomcats peeking from inside an aurora australis. The gem in my ring is dying through my neglect. Composed of a measure of water, opals must be worn habitually so they might feast, replenishing themselves on sweaty fingers or the base of a neck. They need natural light to show their true colours. That is all they are, really. Thirst and ball-bearing tricks of reflection, refraction. My sister on her deathbed insisted, I inherit the ring to prove our family legend wrong, that from that point on, no death would follow each instance of its being worn. I took possession to appease her, but have had to invent my own rules of engagement, as I did with boys all those years ago. First date, external touches of the closed velvet case. Second date, a cautious lifting of the lid. I can't or won't go all the way. The opal in my ring is dying losing the potency of its colours, becoming crazed. How can I blame it for wanting to thrive? The multicoloured eye in the fairy tale oval mirror of its gold setting mocks me as frigid or glares a chromatic challenge or glints in the visual pheromones of seduction, bedroom light on jigsaw colour. It aches for me to pick it up slip it slowly past the tip of my finger all the way down the length of the shaft. Only then would we really know each other and tomorrow we could walk together in the sun. It's dangerous staring into the box too long, knowing my opal ring has already forgotten my sister, knowing that if I reach out and do this one, small thing in return. It promises to love me forever and ever. <laughs> oh, it's a haunting poem, isn't it? It's a haunting family legend. Well, it's a haunting family legend, but it's also um, quite brazenly um, juxtaposing uh, death with sex, I feel. <laughs> I, I enjoyed that, but I was just wondering if, you, if you're never going to wear it, who, who are you going to pass it on to? Well, nobody, but I'm too scared to even, um, to even sell it because I just worry for the people who would buy it. I guess I will have to throw it in the rubbish and hope nobody finds it. Well, do you know where this legend 
began? Well, my mother said that every time she wore the opal ring, very shortly afterwards, somebody in the family died and nobody questioned it. And, um, but I don't know, she had a lot of very strange ideas about things, but that was the only one that stuck. And I figure it's not even a very nice opal ring. I figure that what's the harm if I just don't wear it? I don't <laughs> want to tempt fate. You never try to work out how many times she wore it and how many people died. No, no, no. I don't really want to know. I just think no. some things you have to take on trust. Sure. Um, so the next poem is The Burren, County Clare. Oh, yes. Um, it's very different again. Yes. Um, in 2011, I did a months long residency at the Tyrone Guthrie Centre in County Monaghan in Ireland. And um, I did quite a bit of touristing before I started the, um, the residency. And this was written as a response to the Burren in County Clare. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a kind of a moonscape. It's just full of fossils and there's, there's hardly a sign of vegetation anywhere. And um, it's really quite a confronting landscape. And um, I started to think about Vislava Simborska's um, poem, I don't know if you've ever read it, um, called uh, View with a Grain of Sand. Mm. And the basic premise of the poem, which I've kind of brought into this poem, is that the names that we give to things, whether it's a tree, whether it's a rock, we somehow embody those things with their names. So we somehow give them the claim to that name, but the things, the rocks, um, the trees, don't see themselves as rocks and trees. And I was really intrigued about that idea that we, we feel the need to name everything in our world and then we treat it as if it embodies its name. Mm. And that's why there's a line in here about um, nature abhorring the vacuum, except, of course, it doesn't. Um, the Burren, County Clare. I brought home two shards of stone the size of a premature baby's fist from the other side of the world and something less easy to steal, a kind of absence that isn't smooth but a crazy pave of gripes and clinks and all connected on a mat pier for a planet sharp and broken skin. The burren is a brain left out in the sun, grown tired of yearning for its megalithic ocean. Each square inch graffiti was sea-going fossils. In 1700, Edmund Ludlow saw nothing but wasteland, country with no water to drown a man in, no trees to hang him, no earth to bury him. But the places that get inside us those that have meaning for the long haul are always alien, never need us. They exist only out of their element. I remember the cloven hooves of cattle clattering over the barren surface like clock ticks, the long pink straps of their tongues dipping for plants that grow between fissures under the pewter of a west country sky proving nature abhors a vacuum, except, of course, it doesn't, nor the opposite of abhorring, nor anything in between. It's we who hate emptiness. So here, in these two shards of stone, can you see the miracle, the bright, brave flowers of ammonites sprung from a barren land? The places that get inside us. I like that. I mean, I like that very much. Um, and it seems to us that, it seems to me that so much of our life is about trying to connect with place. Yes. Trying to connect with, you know, and not just in the sense of acknowledgement of country for, for Indigenous people here, but all of us are looking for where we came from and, and, and somehow or other it's very important to how we see ourselves. Um, and I think this poem I mean, that, was, is that, that place was not really part of your inheritance, is it? But, but you have that sense 
No, but I meant it in term. Well, I think of it in terms of all of our inheritances. You know, I think until we acknowledge that we can never really be inside place, um, or it's not what we think it is, we're always looking for our own reflection. Yeah. Um, some reflection of ourselves, and it's not. It's it's something we manufacture it, that. Our environment is apart from us, unless we are, you know, um, indigenous, and then it's a different story. But I think, particularly for most Europeans, no matter how we try, there is a barrier between us and our environment. But and you've it. I feel that we're, you know, um, we're the worse off for it. But that doesn't mean that we should co-opt our environment to kind of support us or um, validate us or any of those things. We don't have the right to do that. No, but what you've done here is you've, you've kind of reversed the, the thought. And yeah. Said, the place yeah. is yeah. like us. This yeah. is where it is. Yeah. And not we inside the place. Yeah. Um, so I think and, uh, well, it occurred to me when I was there just how uncomfortable it is to be in an environment where you can't relate to anything in the environment. It was just such an alien looking mm. place, you know, like another planet that mm. you you would never get to visit. So you've, you have no familiarity with whatsoever and how uncomfortable that makes us as humans. Yeah. Now the next poem, Celtic Fort, is that County, County Monaghan, is that more closely aligned to inheritance in the... In the... Well, I mean, the inheritance certainly of, um, of history when I was in Ireland, and many people say this, but I was just overwhelmed with the um, melancholy atmosphere. And I think it's because coming from Australia where the sky is so wide, to have the sky is very low in Ireland and you can almost feel it, the weight of history or the weight of the sky or the weight of something in the environment pushing down on you. Mm. And um, everywhere there are, there's abandoned Celtic forts. And, um, you know, it seems such an exotic thing to see a castle or a, a Celtic fort, but they're just everywhere dotted around the countryside. And there was one within walking distance of where I was staying at um, the Tyron Guthrie Centre. And um, another person who was staying there at a time, we struck up a friendship. And when he was talking to me about his marriage, we went for a walk to this Celtic fort. And when he was talking to me about his marriage, I just, I married the two together because I thought that they went together um, mm. as far as the way that where human beings fit in an environment like that. And also it made me question whether, I think if you're Irish, you would be used to the environment, but I think anyone going to Ireland, as well as the beauty, is struck by to one degree or another, by the weight of history. Mm. So in that way, I think the inheritance there is just um, so much heavier than it is here in Australia. And that's just a matter of years. You know, Europeans have been in Australia so few years in comparison. So this is Celtic Fort, and it's got a little epigraph as well from Comrade Eichen, and he said in his poem, this is the world, there is no more than this. Speak, and the ghosts of change, past and to come, throng the brief word. Nothing left of it now but a modest hill with 360 degree views of sown fields, pockets turned inside out for the seamstress needle. The hedge sutures are dark and between them that endless Irish cliche, green on green. No one could have ambushed the Celts with the lack of blind spots in their lookouts turning vision and the stone bones of their miseries so finely tuned they would ache at the change in the weather of an unfamiliar quiverful of desolation. My imagination stuck in the domestic, looking down to the ghost of an ox dragging an ordinary plough through an arable day in the land below, 
Its Viking horns etch the shape of a begging bowl. Its eyes are musket balls with lashes slowly blinking. It seems to swim inside its wooden yoke and while the entrapment's constant, it would only be truly painful, I think, when the ox shook its head. D, standing beside me, confesses he is restless. After 30 years of waking to the same face on the opposite pillow, he doesn't think his marriage can survive the loss of that flame. I say nothing, but wonder why, with all of its charge, the heart is too stubborn to conjure a single spark of passion on its own. He stares out to some lost horizon now, hoping for a break in the impasse, something solid to roar against, a beloved enemy charging over the next hill. But all is still, the grey air so close, holding its breath, and no birds sing. This sight could be mistaken for somewhere holy, but that's just time and the imaginary wisdom of continuance. What is real is a trinity unchanged for millennia, the ache of human melancholy settled in the gap between the sky sinking and the land rising up to meet it. Well, there's a kind of... Um cultural inheritance we have we're all mired in too isn't there i mean the, the notion of romantic love is relatively new in historical terms very true it's uh, it said to be unnatural couldn't it <laughs> over the long term well uh, I, I didn't say that you said that <laughs> but <laughs> yeah well it could be and and the, the thing is that it binds us we're, we're all infected if you like we're impacted by infected uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, or that notion of uh and also that sort of sense of melancholy and that sort of muddling through our lives is part of the inheritance that we... Well, and, and the persistent emptiness, um, despite getting all that we may want and despite having every one of our desires as we see them fulfilled, there's still an emptiness there. And we, we have not been taught to um, tolerate the emptiness that's just part of being alive. Um, and I think the poem's a little bit about that as well. You know, our expectations of what it is to be happy, for instance, or what it is to be content. That's a cultural thing too, obviously. Certainly in the, the first world. Yes. I keep pointing out to my children, that's a first world problem. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so we've gone back in time and back in place and now we're going to come back to directly to your to your ancestors and uh, yes so that's going yeah. even further back in time um i obviously had to do a lot of research um before i started writing dark convicts and the research was really fascinating but i had to whittle down what i needed i decided i wanted to tell a story of John Martin and John Randall without me intruding. And for that, I had to, I had to find a mode of telling. And it was possible, it was, no, it wasn't possibly, it was the hardest book that I've ever had to decide how to tell a story. And I settled on um, a 13 syllable line um, that doesn't observe any, um, stressed or unstressed syllables. And I thought I was totally crazy when I came up with this idea, even though I liked the fact that depending on how many syllables, or depending on how long the words were, not how many syllables in the line, the lines could appear very differently. And um, I spoke to Jeff Page about it because, you know, Jeff's the expert on these things. And he said, oh, I don't know, nobody's ever done that. And then I found in America um, this poet called John Hollander and he'd actually done exactly that and he had a series of poems called The Thirteeners and so I felt validated then to continue. But the reason why I chose it was not because I was wanted something different to do. I wanted, I wanted to have a flavour of the time but I didn't want to have... I didn't want to have a... 
any sort of a rhythmic pattern that would be instantly recognisable because it's just too much of a cliche, you know, the old shanties of Bound for Botany Bay. And I wanted a bit of that, but I didn't want the whole thing to be overwhelmed by that. So I hope that the poems give a sense that um, this is not set in our time and place. It's set in the past. Um, so the first poem, um, is it okay if I read this one? Please. This is actually um, made up from the court transcript of John Martin after he had he was put on trial and um, after he'd stolen the bundle of clothing. And it should be noted that anything that was stolen that was over the value of 39 shillings was an automatic death by hanging. And sometimes if the judges were feeling lenient, they would, or the jury would reduce the value of the clothing so that then it was transportation rather than um, hanging. And the other thing was that that wasn't necessarily because they were deeply compassionate. At the time, there was a bit of a, a social uprising, you know, the more genteel um, families in London thought it was unsightly to have, you know, bodies hanging all over the place. Um, and so they, they kind of were pushing to, for that change to happen. Caught black-handed, the Old Bailey. John Martin Negro is hereby indicted for stealing two cloth coats, one waistcoat, one pair of stuffed breeches, above featured belonging to one Stephen Turnbull, plus two cloth coats, two waistcoats, ditto cloth breeches, one cotton waistcoat, one linen, one petty, yes, cotton coat, one gown as above, cotton again, the goods of John Turnbull in his dwelling house. On May the 18th, 1782, the combined value accrues to 48 shillings. Stephen Turnbull's most willing deposition recorded forthwith. I go up the one pair of stairs to find the door open. That thieving black wretch boulders brass in the room. It is not too dark, thank the heavens, or I wouldn't have seen him at all. The prisoner runs past me in the hall with the bundle of clothing tucked under his arm. I pursue said goods with said negro attached and quickly bring them both back. The clothes packed in their open and shut case of guilt I show fast and loose to this court, hoping their plain as day material witness makes a fine noose. But a thread of compassion has come loose, the values reduced to 39 shillings. Martin's sentence, God willing, a suitable site is settled on soon. Transportation for seven years to any old where, who cares when the judge has one less death on his conscience, so long as it's beyond aggravation, a far flung distance from here. So, that was at the time when they hadn't decided on where they were going to transport all of these, um, all of these criminals. Yeah, and you said you had to do a lot of research. How on earth did you find those records? Um, well, a lot of the work had been done by my sister and um, there was a book that was written by Cassandra Pybus called um, Black Founders mm. and um, I followed up on her, her um, bibliography at the end of the book. I followed up on her texts and... You know, I had these connections with my own texts from what my sister had done, um, her research, and I just managed to, to put it all together. It was a lot easier finding out about John Randall because the army kept records. Mm. Um, it was a lot more difficult finding out about John Martin because basically you have to cobble together. When they come to the attention of the law, for instance, then, you know, this document was available in the old Bailey um, documents. But basically someone like John Martin had to come to the attention of somebody to make it noteworthy that, you know, of what he was doing. And that's the way that I found out a lot of the things that happened to him 
in the new colony and including the poem that I've written about the 25 lashes because the um, officers recorded, mm. oh, I can't remember which one now, but in one of the officers' um, diaries that they kept at the time, it was recorded that John Martin, along with the two other convicts that were living, living in a Wattle and Dorm hut, had been um, given 25 lashes for lighting a fire in their hut to keep warm. What, you, what it doesn't say is that those huts were not really weatherproof. Um, the wind blew straight through them, through the, straight through the windows, would have been freezing. They didn't have any clothes um, to speak of. They only had the clothes that they came over with on the first fleet. This was, this was in the first year of, um, of settlement. And so it seems a fairly, um, fairly severe punishment. Yeah. For, um, but then you have to remember that in those first couple of years, it was a military outpost. So there were only two punishments, lashing or hanging. Yeah. There was nothing else... I just want to go back to that last poem. What was it like for you to read that for the first time when you, when you can't uncover it? And John Martin, there it is. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the one about what he'd stolen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic. That was one of the pieces um, that I already had, that my sister had unearthed. Mm. And um, so that was kind of an easy one to oh, track right. down because I basically had her research. Um, and actually, Thomas Keneally gave a passing reference to John Martin as well in his book, Commonwealth of Slaves, right. or Commonwealth of, what did it, I can't remember, Commonwealth of Slaves, Commonwealth of Thieves, Commonwealth of Thieves. Mm. And he'd made mention of John Martin. And interestingly, he came to a different conclusion about where John Martin had stolen the clothing from than I did, um, but I don't know if he had read the transcript because Stephen Turnbull, that was Stephen Turnbull's deposition, and yeah. he made poetic, yeah. but um, basically he said that he walked up the pair, of, the pair of stairs, they must have had two, two rows of stairs going upstairs, and he'd seen John Martin in the house. Yeah. So he could have been working in the house, um, or he could have just seen an opportunity and just come into the house. Yeah. But, um, yes, it makes it more real. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, John Martin's 25 Lashes. Yes. Um, okay. The governor said before we left England, there will be no slavery in New South Wales no terror through violence, no forced labour, stripped to the waist on this cold August day, tied to the tree at ankles and wrists with the blood of others who have come before me, soaked into the bark, pushed against my cheek. I think of this. The governor said before we left England, there'll be no slavery in New South Wales. The drum beats, I bite my lip hard, the first lash tears open thin skin. The flogger clears the gore with his fingertips to make sure the next lash will let those knots dig in. The drum beats again and the cat chews in deep. I slump at the pain and can't help but moan low. The governor said before we left England that there will not be slavery in New South Wales. The flogger clears the gall with his fingertips to make sure the next lash will let those knots dig in. I'm almost free by their law, but it makes no difference as I'm still enslaved. But the governor swore right before we left England there will be no slavery in New South Wales. The drum beats, the lash bites. I feel the long hot bit of flow. The flogger clears the gall with his fingertips to ensure the full hell of those knots can dig all the way in. The governor lied before we left England. There is nothing but slavery in New South Wales. The drum beats, 
the lash bites into muscle. This time I cry out. The flogger seems pleased, clearing the gall with his bloody fingertips to make sure the next lash will let those knots make chopped meat of my back. The drum beats, my bowels loosen, the cat flays, I cry out, and the flogger seems pleased, clearing the gall with his fingertips to ensure the lash follows the score in his much pleasured head. Like a fond sweetheart, he whispers, cheer up, you black bastard. I brought your back five red roses with thorns, and you've still got some 20 more pricks to go. Pain's how you know you're not dead. Well, the repetition in this poem is used uh, to very dramatic effect, I think, almost as if almost as if they're lashes themselves, each line that you repeat. Mm, it's an uncomfortable poem on all, all sorts of levels. It is, and, and you wondered whether or not I, I wanted you to read it, but I did because I think it's compelling. Um, and, I, and I wonder here, that the trick, I think, to make a poem like that compelling and authentic is to get inside John Martin's head. Mm. And how did you do that exactly? Um, well, with that particular poem, I was just, I'd read about what the lashing entailed and I was just so appalled and upset. I just felt like I had to actually embody that emotion because you can say the words, oh, somebody was given 30 lashes, but viscerally you don't know what that's like. Mm. Um, and I just felt with that particular incidence, I wanted people to feel what it was like, feel uncomfortable, mm. feel that, and the repetitions are basically to just keep reinforcing and not yep. let the reader off the hook, yep. and which is a small price to pay when you think of, you know, what, what it must have been like having the real thing happen. And quite often, psychologically, it was so hard for them too because they might have a dead body hanging above them they use the same tree for lashing as they did for hanging. And so you might be tied to the tree below being lashed while a dead body's hanging just a few inches above your head. Just awful. Mm. And um, we have one more poem, John Martin. Oh, yes. Um, John Martin was actually um, three years after his sentence had technically expired he was finally given his land grant. And that was a result of, was something that was a problem for many of the convicts. The papers didn't come from London um, to declare them free. And so the governor basically said, well, you know, you just have to keep behaving like a convict until the papers come. And um, yeah, so it ended up that he wasn't a young man by the time he, he actually received his 50 acres, his land grant. And it was saying land grant's a bit of a misnomer because it was basically just wild scrub. And um, for somebody who was really poor and didn't curry favour with the officers the way that John Randall did, for John Martin, he couldn't afford to employ um, you, a convict to help him actually clear the land. And so he had to do it all on his own. And um, some might say it's probably more of a curse than a blessing, but anyway, this is John Martin's 50 acres. This is a measure of what an emancipated convict is given. 50 acres of spine snapping bush, eucalypts that scratch the throat of the sky and are apt to explode while your tongue's in the heat. Spear grass with shallow sighs, legs to tatters. The fast fangs of venomed snakes that hide, coiled in a syringe of each hollow log. Those who take up land grants are awarded a single tomahawk, two pigs, one hatchet, two spades, one shovel. Expectations of being off all stores in 18 months. That first dry summer, Rain fell in the shape of birds arrested by death in mid-flight. It was that hot, 115 degrees in the shadows, the ground like the base of a pot suspended over a fire. The west wind simmered and smoked, 
Then the flames came across the parched Sydney town basin and knocked the lid of hell off. Flames galloped the trees with a million dirty hooves gorged on the leaves, then shit black ash on my head, burnt up orange flares. The sun's knotted vein belly hung low, veiled in its shroud in the height of the day. I beat hot breath back from the door and covered all of the windows with damp canvas. Somehow the firestorm leapt right over me, unbridled, unsettled, unreined. I stared at my own fierce black gaze in the mirror, pulled back from the furnace only by luck. And I knew another bargain of entrapment had been struck. This land owned me, even though the governor said that I owned it. 50 acres of wild-eyed, untamed country, hard chomping at the bit. Yeah, it's almost surreal hearing this poem after the fires of last summer here. Um, yes, yes, nothing lot. much has changed. I, I remember when I was reading about the lightning storms in the first year of settlement in February and I thought nothing's changed and the fires and, you know, yeah, it's, it's always, always been, been a very harsh climate. Harsh climate and it's always been fraught to, to farm the land here. It's always been difficult and there's nothing, it's nothing new. It just seems that it's more intense now and more compounded by changes to our climate. But it's always tough. We kind of tend to forget it sometimes, but that poem takes us right back to the beginning where it was like... It does. It does. It's worth it, mind you, but it is definitely not an easy environment to live in, is it? Mm. Thank you so much, Judy. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, when this video is posted, there will be information about where and how to get uh, Judy's books uh, next month. Uh, September 2020, we will be back with Libby Hart, who will be uh, reading and talking on the theme of the mess we're in. We'll see you then.